Okay, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Professor Gray, and I'm introducing our guests today, uh, Laura Hartman and Richard Furneaux, joining us from Berkeley, California. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, it's it, with great pleasure I uh, welcome our guests to school today. Uh, Richard and Laura were both uh, mentors of mine, and uh, I've spent a, a good deal uh, of time uh, working with them both, and uh, uh, have admired the work of the firm for Noah and Hartman for some years, so it's great to, to have you here to share it with the students. Uh, Laura Hartman is uh, 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 re AIA, registered architect, lead accredited professional, and Laura received her uh, Bachelor of Art from Smith College and Master of Architecture from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and before becoming a partner at for Noah and Hartman, Laura uh, practiced as a uh, designer with Esher Combsy Dodge and Davis in San Francisco, and uh, also spent some time uh, working in Switzerland as well. Uh, Laura frequently serves on architecture design juries and uh, is a, an adept teacher having uh, lectured at numerous universities uh, around the country. <coughs> uh, Richard uh, Furneaux is a, is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, and Richard uh, uh, was educated at the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he studied uh, philosophy in his undergrad, and, and uh, like Laura, got his master's degree from the University of California at Berkeley, where he now teaches uh, and is a professor at uh, uh, the University of California, full professor. Uh, Richard opened his practice in 1978 and, and joined forces with Laura in, in 1980. Uh, and, uh, uh, as I said, Richard is a fellow of the American uh, Institute of Architects. The work has been widely recognized. I'm not going to go into the list of uh, awards, publications, and recognition that uh, each have received, uh, both individually and uh, uh, in collaboration with Furneaux, as Furneaux and Hartman. Uh, Richard's fundamental commitment to sustainability dates back to the 1970s, uh, is uh, uh, apparent in the work today and more recently. Uh, the work of Furneaux and Hartman was included in the traveling show Ten Shades of Green, uh, which is an international traveling exhibit featuring the best of contemporary sustainable design. Uh, I think uh, uh, most recently out in Washington. Am I right about that? I think that show was in D.C. when I was out there. Uh, the work of Furneaux and Hartman has been widely recognized uh, with awards uh, featured in numerous publications, including Architectural Record, Progressive Architecture, Global Architecture and the New York Times, to name just a few. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have them with us today, uh, sharing some of their recent work, and uh, I hope you'll join me in welcome, wel welcoming them to, uh, to Ball State. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's great to be here. We have a kind of a long-term relationship with Ball State. Um, not only having known Tim for quite a while and worked with him in our office, but we've had a couple of interns from here, um, one last year and one a few years ago. So we have a fondness. They've been really excellent interns and fit, fit in with our office really well. And it's nice to finally be here and see the, see the physical environment that, that people work in. Um, we're going to start today. Uh, this is a this is Robert Smithson's sketch and beautiful prediction of asphalt coming down a slope, and then the reality when he actually went to the site and dumped the asphalt. And uh, in a way, as, as we're starting to, it's it's great to give a lecture because it gives you kind of a, a chance to look back at your work, to sift through the fragments, and really think about what the influences have been, and think about ideas that. Um, emerge, in some ways emerge as you look backward, and some that you find that have disappeared and, and gone away. Um, and, and in many ways, as I look at this slide, it's just to say it's, it's never quite what you thought it would be when you set out. It's, it's a changing kind of dynamic look at um, what practice is. And today we're going to sort of organize, we're going to pass things back and forth, kind of a tag team approach. And we have three main stories that we want to tell. Um, one is the story of, it's very, kind of, just a brief kind of conceptual underpinnings of our work. And then we want to talk about uh, more concrete, you know, actual projects and how we've developed things. And then at the end we have a kind of shaggy dog story. 
Because one of the things we've realized as we look back that there's a, there's a thread in our work um, that's about digression, that's about taking not maybe the interstate or the main way through architecture, the main path through a career in architecture. It's more about taking the back roads, looking sideways, looking behind you, looking at things that uh, maybe aren't on the normal routes. And as we tell these stories today, we'll sort of weave in and out these digressions that we've sort of seen and pulled together to organize our work today. Um, collaboration is a really fundamental part of our practice. And we've, uh, this is a drawing that Tim did when he was working in our office years ago. Um, and we've come to see that architecture, in many ways, it's, it's more like a performing art. Um, I think it's often thought of as a fine art. But the way in which a performing art is dynamic, it's changing. It's, 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 a, it's, um, it's not fixed. It's more like dance or theater or music. Um, we've come to look at architecture in that way. And we find that in collaboration, there's the opportunity for multiple voices to be heard both in the production and the design of the work, but to be heard and seen in the work as it, as it lives over time. Um, we had, um, in some ways, a too much time to prepare and, and too little. Because normally, I mean, I think the topic of our lecture is circumstantial architecture. And um, we're kind of involved in, in doing some writing now and developing that theme. but. Uh, in the opportunity to talk, we started coming up with a secondary notion about uh, deviations and about sort of leaving the track. And in some sense, that's going to be the model of the lecture, because in one way, you know, the most interesting things are always when you, when you leave the track. Um, the part of our uh, sort of lineage, we're sort of looking back at the fragments. I mean, one of the great things about um, having practice and having actually struggled to get something done, which takes forever, as you all know, in architecture, um, is that you can you know, stop and you can look back. Because when you're going through work, I mean, you have certain ideas that you bring to it. You can, you know, when you look back, you see that the work itself tells you something. And some of these ideas we're talking about today are the work, the ideas that sort of came to us, some that we were unaware of at the time. Uh, one model we had from the beginning, though, is this notion that, that architecture is circumstantial. And these uh, are sketches here that sort of, in some sense, are the, um, the physical manifestation of it. These are by Victor Hugo, better known for, uh, as a writer. Um, but one of the interesting things, he did a whole series of drawing experiments. And one of uh, the, they took two types, but they were Tosh's, which are these ink blots where he'd start, and I think we probably all have done them, where you find a blot or something and you start to elaborate on it and make it into something else. And uh, he would visit certain themes onto them. Maybe he had favorite themes, like a bird was one of them. Uh, but he had several themes. But the idea of starting with something as opposed to starting, not even necessarily something that you might desire, choose, uh, even find uh, pleasurable, but you start there and you make that evolve. You work with it. Uh, and for us, that, that's a very much a model of what the architecture practice is. I mean, it, it's not, like Laura was saying, it's not like the fine arts. There's no clean slate. There's no canvas. You start with a whole set of uh, priorities, conditions, circumstances that weren't of your choosing. It's how you take those and how you work with those, like an improvisational situation in theater or music, which is part of our backgrounds. And then you transform those a, into something. Uh, Hugo's experiments, I mean, if this was one where you find a blot and he would work with it or even have other people generate it, then he also had a set of experiments where he would make his own blot, which is kind of slightly perverse, needless to say. But he would make a blot, he'd spill ink, and then he would try to control it during the process, letting it sort of roll back and forth and creating something. And then his drawings would start uh, on that basis, which also seemed like a fabulous metaphor for what architecture is, because you do start with these circumstances. They may not be what you would have chosen, but you often enter at a time when you can still affect those changes. You can start to move them and shift the blob, and then at that point, you know, things tighten down and you begin to perform your work as an architect or as a designer. But th those are models for, for us on how, what it is architecture is. And to some extent, we're fascinated with that. The reason we mention it is we're fascinated with that story because in some way, looking back at our stuff, we realize that 
we want in some way to our architecture to embody the story rather than get to the end, realize it's sort of somewhat chaotic, and then try to clean it all up. Uh, that hasn't been our impulse. Next. Uh, which is, it explains partially I mean, for us, I mean, and I think maybe for you, you know, our interest in collage as we move you know, forward. Because you know, the nature of collage is such that you, know, you have whole parts and parts that exist there and, and you know, remain what they are. And they sort of resist your efforts to change them. It's only what you bring them against you know, or lay over them that starts to change what the, the meaning is. But it, it's a very powerful medium, and I think a powerful metaphor for what architecture is. Um, and there are many different ways that it's practiced, but I mean, someone like Rauschenberg literally had a system of, that forced him into you know, incorporating pieces he may not have chosen. And he would have a system, he'd walk around the block, he'd find something, and he'd say, okay, you can only resolve this composition by going around the block once more or you know, the other way around the block. But he had a couple of things, but then it's, it's over, it has to be resolved which again, to us, it really represents the story of what architecture is in that way that I think, I, when we say it's circumstantial, I think we hold it to a higher plane than, than in other forms of art, we have a greater deal of control. I mean, you have to accommodate. Next. In my dealings, I teach theory. Well, right now I'm teaching theory at, at uh, Berkeley, but I teach just about everything um, at different times. But uh, my, my students, were, we were talking about the difference between collage and montage, and they were saying, you know, Richard, you know, collage is passe, it's all about montage, it's all about sort of continuity, and, and it may well be, but this is, you know, in that uh, debate, we were, I was talking about how can you diminish the power of stuff, you know, in some way stuff has power, and it's sort of the bringing together of it that, you know, these three objects become something, uh, or three things become something much greater, you know, in that conjunction that, could, that you could ever sort of create without sort of dealing with real artifacts in the world. Next. In thinking about the, the back roads and, and vernacular architecture, I mean, one of the reasons we're drawn to it is um, we come to see it as an architecture of expedience, that it's, it's the problem solving. It's, it's the uh, use of, kind of the minimal use of materials in scarce conditions. Um, it's not so much the, the style or the um, the look of it, it's really the, what goes into the making of it. And in many ways, it's a common language that, um, you know, throughout the world, uh, vernacular architecture, whether it's solving for sunshade in Mississippi or in uh, how to get coal onto a train or onto a boat in Pennsylvania. So um, the next group of slides have to do with sort of our education as architects. And uh, this was, uh, which we call ourselves feral or sort of self-taught architects. That was our, this, these two were our original office. And uh, we graduated at a time where, you know, you know architecture, uh, the politics of the schools obviously changes over time. And we graduated at a time where uh, the fine art or even the design aspect of architecture wasn't talked about. It, it was much more about process, much more about social conditions. So that some level, when you came out uh, to begin practice, you taught yourself you know, those things. But that's going to be true for you, even though um, it'll be a different set of conditions. But in any event, when we got out, um, we were largely self-taught about what the stuff of architecture was. And uh, this being our office, it happened to be in a section of the you know, Bay Area, Berkeley, where we're from, that uh, had a lineage, an architectural lineage that is fairly well known and in some sense, although, next slide, although we never um, you know, thought a great deal about it. This is a, a house by Bernard Maybeck that was you know, basically our conference area was in there and it had a whole tradition of outdoor rooms. It was this first blush of Europeans coming to you know, this promised land which they thought of as the Athens of the West or America and they would uh, design in some way that kind of responded to those conditions. Next. But uh, I mean, they were an odd and eccentric bunch. I mean, this is Bernard Maybeck here. And, the, and it was in that yard that our office was. And actually, he had constructed a portion of our office years ago. Um, yeah, just to, what he represents in the Bay Area, he's sort of the father of it. This was his first client, this, this totally eccentric character over here who was a poet, uh, a guy named Keeler. In any event, next. 
you know, we, you know, while we knew the stories of these things, it's a bit like, you know, when you're growing up in your family and, um, you know, you think they're odd, but you don't really understand how odd they are until you wait to go, go away to college. And then you say, my God, they really were odd. Uh, to some extent, the sort of you know, notable Bay Area sort of tradition that we kind of grew up in, we didn't realize how odd it was and what a, you know, in a way, digression from the overall tradition was until we sort of got in some removed from it. But to educate you in one minute about what that might be, this was um, the house that, you know, that uh, Bernard Maybach did for the poet Keeler. And it was some model of uh, they, you know, digression in, in it itself. They, you know, kind of the, I think the, in the end, it was an idea of looking at a remodel aesthetic. I mean, it was the, the way in which it would not appear new and it was kind of rambling, which is in some sense you know, a piece of what the Bay Area is. I mean, they, the school they came out of was the Beaux-Arts was a very different tradition. It was a very ordered tradition, and this was a disordered tradition. I mean, there's uh, moving up through it, there's Cox Head with another eccentric, and you can kind of feel in the proportions of what he did you know, they're sort of accentuating the site and the site conditions and the particularities of a place over the sort of compositional symmetry. And uh, William Worcester, you know, who is very understated but dealt often with the, the sites and outdoor rooms and conditions. Next. And, you know, what might be better known is uh, Escherich, who was, was sort of a proto-green designer, starting with you know, the sort of basic conditions of appreciating the site and understanding the sun you know, movements and those, and also sort of just the social conditions that they kind of dealt with the sort of modernist vocabulary, but at some level you know, allowed other players to enter. And finally, the the Sea Ranch, you know, which is all part of that tradition of dealing with site and climate. Next. Um, you know, under, underlying all that is kind of a relationship, which I think you found in the West. I mean, Mumford wrote about this in the, in the sort of 50s, where he started talking about the Bay Area School and how it was a variant on you know, modernism in a different sort of way of accommodating uh, a modernism that had a flavor as opposed to the international style. Next, and you know, emphasizing the fact that it dealt with limits and dealt with uh, the environment. Next. Um, given those set of theories, which were what we kind of came out of our school with and developed in the first years or two, uh, this was the first job that we got of any import. Uh, you know, we got a phone call to remodel this building, and uh, we had no idea when we got the phone call. It came from, you know, the Napa Valley, and we had all the fantasies that any architect would have about a new job in the Napa Valley, and finally someone had read about us or knew something. and then. We uh, pulled up, and this was the this is the project. Um, and next, and uh, it was for two painters that lived there. And the process that we developed with them was extremely collaborative because we knew from the uh, start that the, this project was going to need to be collaborative to function and to work. And one of the issues that we dealt with was if this was the piece that we kept of that whole mess that you saw. It was to keep that as sort of a datum and then begin to develop an architecture that branched out of that. So at the end of the process, you had both what was there and something completely new. Next. And you, know, you can see, this is very early on, you can see what the, how the project developed as we pulled this uh, bits and pieces of the architecture out and created between the different pieces a, a sort of internal space. Next. You know, one of our goals was to, to uh, what the Napa, for those of you who have been out to the Napa Valley, it's a, it's a really wonderful area. It's the wine area of California. But unfortunately, the way it's been spelled out architecturally is that the architecture is this zany architecture. And it's either wildly historicist from you know, somewhere Mediterranean, south of somewhere, or it's kind of off the charts architecture. But the last thing, that it seems to be that it's ever is employs the vernacular of what's there. I mean, that seems to be the no-no. And this was our polemic to say, no, it could be about the kinds of shapes of buildings that are already there. Nick? This next group of projects are other projects in the Bay Area, all of which um, take their fundamental direction from the character of the site. Um, our goal in this first project was to really see how much of the daily activity of living in this house could happen outdoors. And we really wanted to bring as much of the inside activity to the outside as possible. 
and make the house as small as we, as, as we could. Um, in developing this, um, we had this main entry, which you kind of walked around almost like a monastery that you perambulate. And then you enter into a, a central courtyard. It's, a, it's also an exercise in how you, how you develop a courtyard house on a sloping site. Tim worked with us on this as well. Um, and you come into this central courtyard, which is really the main living space. And we tried to bring as much of the activity of sitting around the fireplace, cooking, eating, to this courtyard. And then finally up at the type, top is a sort of garden space, which is almost like another outdoor living room, which is supported by a, a, a guest room and a bathroom. And sort of working these um, as much as we could, bringing activity to the outside, we ran into problems with the local um, design review people. They said, your house isn't big enough. And <laughs> we're going to penalize you. Um, you haven't made it big enough. And our client said, it's all we want. We don't want it any bigger. These are st stupid rules. These people live in these kind of blown up Tudor houses next door. And so we strategized and said, what do we do? How do we deal with this? So we left the design the same. And we put a, a kind of small basement under one end which holds mechanical system and a little bit of storage in order to, to meet that demand to have a certain level of square footage. Um, this just shows you as you move through the entry, the, the courtyard at the center, and then the philosopher's garden at the top of the site, where in this sort of hot Sonoma County climate, like in Crete, you want to get as much shade as you can to sit comfortably outside. The next project is, is somewhat similar um, in design in that it's a series of courtyards, although it's, an ex it's a totally different site. It's the top of a hill. Um, it had beneficent winds at some times of the year and really wind that you wanted to block at other times of the year. And it also had wonderful views and it had some close neighbors that you didn't want to see. So developing a kind of a meandering courtyard, so a more informal strategy where you could either be in the sun and get the main view, or you could kind of come around and hide and be out of the sun when it gets very hot. And then breaking apart um, parts of the building, this sort of dog trot strategy, so you can open up parts of the building to get shade and view, and then isolating and keeping you from being able to see, and you know, sort of like blinders to keep you from seeing in certain directions was, was part of the strategy to um, make it comfortable to be there. Um, this next house, which is in um, Marin County, and it's a much more, in some ways, much more rural site, much more untouched landscape. And how you put a building on the land, how you make a mark on the land, and yet in many ways you want it to be erased or to be very quiet and not very visible. Um, and our, our impulse at first was to, to dig the house into the land. These are the story poles that we put up to understand how it would sit in the landscape. We're trying to pull it in um, at one end and then let it extend out to catch views and, and sun at the other end was part of our strategy. And there was this one um, central bar, this sort of main piece of the building, that, in, that is interrupted by two bays, one with the kitchen and one with the bedrooms in it. And these help form protected outdoor space because, again, it's, it can be very windy, and yet the wind changes direction. So to be able to be on one side of the house when the wind's coming from the other side and then to be able to switch and keep out of the wind was part of the strategy. Um, our first inclination was to kind of hunker down and hide behind this cluster of oaks. But as we understood the soil better and we understood that there was a spring that ran right through the site, and as our client had desired to get some more distant views, we pulled the house out from the trees. But in doing that, we had to take on almost camouflage strategies to help the house be quiet in the landscape, breaking up the form, working with materials from the site, and working with this you know, linear scheme that's interrupted um, on the interior. And each of these wings that pulls into it has an address on the large central space, and the inside is much more colorful and lively, the outside much more quiet, such that from a distance you, you really can hardly, hardly see it as you drive by. There you can see it hunkered into the ground at one end and then coming out at the other. Um, the next project, which um, in some ways is working with, with limits, working with the really specifics of the site situation. We had looked a lot at um, 
sort of the highbrow example like Schindler's King's Road House, this wonderful flow between inside and outside with the outdoor fireplace. And then it more kind of familiar to everybody, the garage, and how the garage is used and how it becomes a kind of living space. It becomes appropriated for daily life and the car is moved out and the lounge chairs are moved in. But it, it also, I think, gets at the point of what, when we often use the word that we're interested in studying and understanding and learning from vernacular strategies, often that's misunderstood as you're uh, interested in the imagery, you know, the, way, the look of a thing, that it's old-timey or it's quaint or it's cute or it's western or it's eastern or whatever it is, or southern. But uh, it's much more vital than that. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, things like the, the tips like these garage, we were brought to this to help work with these people. You just see, you know, these outdoor rooms. You see this desire for a different kind of architectural response. You know, you'll see this door and other uh, designs. But that, that are, are cues for us to, to understand what, what it is that people, you know, sort of want, how they actually live as opposed to, uh, you know, what it is we as architects might want to sort of think about how they live. So this project began with the sort of archetypical courtyard. You know, you have an L-shaped plan, you have a really nice outdoor space, and then you have a single piece pulled out to help shape the courtyard. And in this case, we were working with straw bale. We were really interested in exploring that material for its, the depth, its insulation qualities, but also in using it as a kind of foil. It's doing, letting straw bale do what it does best, and then letting wood frame, which is on the other side of the building, do what it does best in terms of opening to views and, and letting sun in. And so we began um, with this archetypical plan, and given the program, we, prob we thought there would be three of these courtyards moving down the slope in this very nice kind of oak woodland. And then as we developed the plan, modifications need to be, needed to be made. First of all, there was a, a really large oak that we wanted to bend and sort of break the courtyard around. And then as you move further down the slight site, there were programmatic demands, the bedrooms be separated and pulled apart. So taking this basic courtyard plan and, and modifying it and adapting it to the slope. Um, in some ways, it's a story that sort of started, got modified, went on an aggression, and then just kind of kept disintegrating a little bit as we moved down the site. I mean, this is an example of the kind of digression that we do that never gets back to the original topic. <laughs> you know, by the time it was at the bottom of the hill, it was a different house than it started, whereas when before, it was kind of returned. This is a courtyard that wraps around the, the oak. Um, here we, you can see the bale that we're working with. Um, in this case, it is infill. It's not load-bearing. But the, you know, the flexibility of it and the ability to carve these wonderful openings and, and make niches in it and open it up. And then playing that off against the more open, sunny side of the house was something that we were looking at. And this living, we call this the living porch where these, this rolling furniture could be moved to the outside. This could be a living room, a guest room, lots of different ways that the space could be used. And then another, another kind of um, digression was this room that bends around the inside of the room that bends around the tree. Um, we call it the elbow room. It's, it actually works like an elbow formally, but it also programmatically is the place for various projects for kids, for music, for all different kinds of activities that change over time. And our uh, truth window in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Um, Which Tim has some issues with, but we, we won't go into that now. <laughs> we, we, we saw his straw bale project today, which is really pretty amazing. He pulled that off. But in any event, uh, the next new group of slides, we've kind of, in the ideas that we're kind of discussing in our own work in our office, we're starting to write about, was mainly the issues came out in the houses we've done. But uh, they also sort of come out in some of the um, institutional and commercial projects. We've included just a few of those. Uh, they're all uh, models in one way or another of collaboration. This first one was uh, for uh, the, um, this is an office for our engineer. And um, this is the model of it. And in a way, it's the sort of felicitous um, you know, collaboration where you know, our goals are relatively similar, our sort of trainings are you know, parallel, and uh, it was a really a great collaboration. We're now doing the building next door, which our office may end up uh, moving to. But uh, it was a, a real school work problem with you know, a cafe below and a housing unit 
attached and you know parking and you know an, art, an office to the engineer above. Next. And you kind of see the, the sort of sensibility with you know, overlap between the engineer and the, the architect, which uh, you know was real pleasure. Next. And uh, this is the this is the case of uh, you know sort of moving down the chain of what collaboration can be. Then this next project uh, was one where we had you know 14 different clients, and they came to us to do a co-housing project. And they had a 30-year experience together at that point, and the way they made decisions was uh, collectively, so that we would make presentations to them, and then they would you know ask questions, and they would go in a room and they're or go away and then send us you know, information about what, what it is they liked, didn't like, and we had to respond to it in that way. It was a very unusual kind of collaboration. Although they, they would never give design suggestions, they would just tell us, you know, this, 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 you, you decide. And uh, so it was an odd collaboration. We thought it would be a nightmare, but in some sense, next slide. Yeah, I think it was, you know, as easy or easier than dealing with your average couple. Um, <laughs> One of the things that happened, though, is, is that they said, that, you know, they said, this is, your, this is the amount of money we have. We want everyone in our collective to be able to move in here. This is retirement. We, and some of them are rich, some of them are poor. But we had to sort of meet this overall budget. And so we came back to them you know, very quickly with this model you can read in green uh, here of what they could afford. And it's a really inexpensive model, shed roofs, exterior circulation. I mean, it's kind of like a you know, motel at that level. It's very clear. And um, said, so, well, this is what you could afford. And then, you know, they, they would say, well, but couldn't you just do this, this, and this? And, you know, we started getting the secondary comments. And the collective ones, we sort of, this drawing we made to show them what they were saying. We said, well, okay, this is what you can afford in green. This is what you all yellow have said you want, whether it's a library or laundry or something off the, uh, you know, living area or something. So this is what we're hearing, and this is, you know, isn't jiving. And then privately, you guys are telling us, I want my room a little bit bigger and I can afford it, you know, or I want a little more light and I can afford it, you know. So we kind of presented them this and said, okay, how do we, how do we resolve this? I mean, the green is what you can afford, this is what you're asking for, uh, where do we go from here? And you say you're collective. And they looked at it and they said, we like it and we like the colors. So the colors stayed, you know, they just kind of said, no, that's reality and we'll take it. So that decided the color scheme for the whole project and it just went ahead like that which is then not what we had anticipated, but uh, met their budget ultimately because they reevaluated. Next. So you can see it was almost in, you know, it's the closest we came as architects to sort of backing away. You know, we really invented a rule system about how to make decisions and allowed them to sort of say, well, a room here, you know, we had areas that they could fill in, uh, you know, and then we just decided to resolve what they brought to us as opposed to, you know, this is what we think it ought to be. And, the, you know, we didn't include some of the most awkward moments, but we included some awkward <laughs> moments. I mean, it was a very interesting exercise, and they've had us back since, and, you know, it, it's interesting. We thought they would completely own it and, and build it, but there's still a way they re rely on us to help interpret the rules or fill things in. But it's been a very successful project. Next. Um, this has been, you know, less so. I mean, I think conceptually it's one of uh, a project that we feel very close to. It's a museum competition in the Napa Valley that we won. And, uh, you know, a museum is a really, or a competition is a really heady experience, and a museum is a heady program. And, uh, you know, our strong sense after working on it was that, you know, the major artifact, it was a museum that didn't really have a collection. I mean, it was an embarrassing and awkward thing, but they didn't have a collection. I mean, they had you know, a bunch of corks, a bunch of labels, some bottles, some you know, pictures of memorabilia, various you know, wealthy people in the valley. But you really looked at it, there wasn't a collection. You know? And uh, so then you go, how do, how do you deal with that circumstance? But then you know, they, they get, in the Napa Valley gets as many people as Disneyland. I mean, you know, literally, I've seen that statistic. I mean, millions of people come to the Napa Valley and then what is that experience? What do they get out of it? How do they interpret it? So we, we interpreted the museum as a, as a way of them interpreting the landscape and the crops. And so we tried to bring the uh, landscape into the museum, creating ways in which you could have planted exhibits and you know, run the two together and you know, explicate the landscape, which is the major, major artifact. And then we had the you know, 
their permanent collection just as the spine you walk through because there wasn't much there. But it was a constant wrestling match. Next. And, uh, you know, when we finally got to the project, because the, the jury loved it, we, we won, then you meet the client. It was arranged marriage. They hated it. You know, they absolutely hated it, you know. And because they weren't gardeners, they had no interest in landscape, you know. Uh, they just didn't like it, you know, I mean, in that way. So you go, it was like this career high and a career low. Um, you know, their boards change, and, and now there are people out there more sympathetic, but it's moving very slowly in terms of the funding. But it's like, uh, what's missing is that essential collaboration you really need. I mean, it felt very powerful, the design without, but without that overlap between interests, you know, you can have a fabulous idea and just miss. And, uh, but this is the first chunk that they built, and, uh, you know, it's sort of going there, but it was, not, it was meant to go at least to here, you know, and it went right to there, and we had to sort of use our circumstantial architecture moves to sort of design an intermediate break-off point and then go on. Next. Uh, you know, really quickly through this, and we're nearing the final story, um, it was a, uh, a community college. And this is a case of, uh, you know, where you're collaborating with the wrong people. You have all these sort of faceless uh, administrators next. And the people we really wanted to be communicating were the students. This is a very poor school. The community college system is really poor in California. And this is a college that originally was done by SOM, had no windows. And what we really were trying to do is pull the program to make spaces for them that are outside the program. You're basically acting as subversive to try to work, create spaces for students. Next. And you know, again, we sort of pulled pieces of the building out, trying to create a courtyard. We, yanked and stretched the roof to try to make, you know, shaded space. It's a very warm place. Next. Yeah, and you can see the sort of fundamental part here, literally stretching the building out to try to get extra program or some useful space, because there are no outside spaces on campus. Next. And you see the result is, you know, just around what we call the edge or the, of the building of the penumbra, that you start to get places for people to hang out. There was sort of unprogrammed space. Next. But similarly, we use some of those strategies. This is a, uh, a school in East Palo Alto, which is near uh, Berkeley, but it's a very uh, sort of inner city neighborhood. And this was a theater they were putting in a, a, a school there. And we were trying to, they were hoping to grow their arts program around it because they didn't have an arts program. And um, the problem with theaters is they're generally black boxes. And you know, they're you know, often taken over by the drama students, which makes sense. But then they're inside, and everything's kind of dark. And then when there's a performance, there's a line. But otherwise, they're not a center of campus. And so again, we were trying to take the various parts and supersize them. And you know, the photo lab, the shop, and you know, next, and start to sort of use the outside of the building and focus as much on the performance of everyday life, where people had lunch. Uh, they rehearse outside and pull those things to the outside. So we sort of fattened the facade and, and used it, but we also created you know, outdoor theater spaces and hung the building over and uh, in a variety of ways just kind of tried to make the program a little bit you know, more commodious. Next. So you start to see that happen there and you know, little zones there. And next. So that the basic program is housed in here. It works fine. That's a dance studio. That's you know, the basic theater. Next. But the parts that we're probably proudest of is how they use the outsides and these various lumps and these little theater sections. It's hard to photograph. It's hard to kind of catch the kids exactly when they're doing it. But they use that space as a place for you know, lunch, as a place for after school. And uh, it's very active. And, and uh, we've uh, you know, just really enjoyed going back to that. But this was like the sh set shop that moves out. Next. Projects we want to look at um, sort of going on the road when we leave the Bay Area and go to work in other parts of the country. And we're again, running over, so we should hustle. I mean, I've been running over. Okay, so. okay. <laughs> I think we're okay. Uh, so that um, you know, learning from vernacular structures, thinking of it as an architecture of expedience, thinking of it as a common language that can, can be brought to bear in different in different places. Um, three or four projects we want to show you. This was in Colorado, and it was a 10,000 square feet, very cold in winter, very exposed to thunderstorms and um, lightning and all sorts of snow. 10,000 square feet or elevation? What are you talking? 10,000 elevation. Sorry. 
10,000 feet high. Yeah, it was a... Because one of the, thank you, one of the things that, uh, it, uh, it's, in some ways it's a small, fairly small house that wants to seem bigger. And every time our client would get cabin fever, we would just add on another building to accommodate their needs. Um, but one of the things that we really wanted to explore in this is being in a place and really being hyper aware of it, being um, at 10,000 feet, moving between buildings. We'd looked at a lot of mining camps. We would had the experience of moving through space at night, being very cold and, and exhilarated. And, and we thought about that a lot on this site. And the outdoor rooms and the sort of strategies we've used in the Bay Area, you might say, well, you can't use those in Colorado at 10,000 feet. And we said, yes, we think this will work. We think it'll make you more aware of where you are that if you, you know, have a, have a nice dinner and then you walk across into the living room by the hot fire, that five seconds you're outside will, will invigorate you. And if you're sleeping in this bed, whether it's inside or whether it's under cover or whether it's all the way out at the end looking down 2,500 square, 2,500 feet into the canyon, you'll, you'll remember where you are and you'll, you'll know what it was like. Um, in another place on the East Coast, in, um, on Martha's Vineyard, we were drawn to looking at these fishing villages. And as much as the gable roof structures, this, this project had very strict design review. Everything had to be a story and a half gable roof building with uh, shingles. But what we were drawn to um, in the buildings that existed there were the spaces in between. And the way these boatyards, shipyards, the way these spaces were used and um, really became active working spaces. So if, as we developed this project, um, it's very buggy there. So a courtyard wouldn't work. We developed a screen porch, and then we docked these little story and a half buildings up to the screen porch, with it being the main outdoor space in between. In um, West Virginia, one of the kind of paths of entry into the project was thinking about the, the local craftspeople and the local materials. There, it's a wonderful area for limestone, and there are all these limestone walls, which we you know, saw at this farm across the road. Um, it's also a great area for hardwood and these um, oak timbers, which they figured out how to dry with radio waves, which was kind of interesting. Um, so working with those materials and craftsmen, and also developing a way in this very jungly, dense, uh, deciduous forest that we could accommodate in a kind of double-jointed, fluid way um, the views, the trees, um, even to the point that during the staking, there were things that could be adjusted and moved to, to work on the site. Um, this last project is uh, in some ways inspired by this, you're, when you're working, we're working in, um, again in Massachusetts, and looking at the Adirondack chair and, and using it as, you know, sort of the traditional, it's a familiar form, and then ways in which this is a chair that Richard designed that's adapted, it's, it's made mobile, has aluminum wheels, you can take it places. And in some ways that's, that's the way we approached this project on the coast in Massachusetts, where there was a 100-year-old family house, the brown shingle, and one proposition was to tear it down, and we said, no, it's going to be more interesting if you keep this house and you bring to it the characters that you want, the openness, the, the, the spatial qualities that you want so that it's not divided into little cells and little bedrooms, and it's more open. And at the same time, we really had a strong desire to make the house naturally ventilated, to eschew air conditioning, because we think it's horrible, and luckily our client did too. And to bring this kind of lung, this gill, to the building, and then it works its way through the building. Um, the spaces are opened up. It, bring, it ventilates upstairs and up out through kind of a belvedere at the top of the house. So it's sort of this modern, sort of contemporary piece that's threaded through this more traditional building. And in a way, they're playing off each other. is sort of greater than the, the sum of the parts. Um, and we had the good fortune to, to do a house um, just a very simple house next door um, in a more contemporary vernacular and, and think about how to tie that into the, the earlier project. Well, this truly is the last project, and we can go quickly, Laura, in terms of snapping the, the slides. But, uh, but in any event, this, this is having us return to uh, Montana, and, uh, or the West, rather, and uh, begin to sort of deal with a very different landscape, a much less, in a way, forgiving landscape than uh, in the East Coast, where you know, things grow over when you make a mistake, you know, it gets covered. Uh, at least that's our perception from the West. The scars stay in the land, and it's actually very fragile. Next. 
Um, so the, our commission was one of those wonderful things that may happen once in your career, if you're lucky, where you get a, a 20,000 acre ranch and they say, find the best place on it. And they give you a couple of horses and you go out there and try to find it. Uh, and it was pretty, pretty interesting uh, notion. This was the town that's close by Clyde Park and this is us. And then this is sort of the beginning of this uh, landscape. Nick? And, uh, you know, we began to try to understand what it is to build in the West. I mean, you know, Berkeley is not near Montana. It's a, it's a very different sort of place. It's very rural, very um, different. But in any event, there's, you know, some things you try to figure out, like, the, what's permanent, what's not, what moves, what's not. Um, and then there are all these uh, anomalies, like this is a, a local bar there where the, this is just kind of there to show you that we really were in Montana. I mean, I guess you get on this horse and then you release the switch, the cow goes over and you rope it or something, you get a free beer. But, uh, you know, different sorts of amusements. Probably go over Mechanical here too. Rodeo. <laughs> you probably have these right here at the quick stop or whatever, but uh, this is the first place we'd seen one, yeah, anyway. But uh, next. Um, but, you know, it's actually very close to the bone there. And talk about digressions. I mean, this is the original building, the digressions of those pieces, at least in our world. But uh, it is very close to the bone. And we are haunted by this question constantly about, you know, building a house for someone from California on a huge ranch. What should that be? Where should it be? And, uh, and even the client kind of weighed in. And because at the same time they wanted what they wanted, like the rest of us, they sort of said, well, wait, well, this is a, a special privilege. And what would a farmer do? What would a farmer want? You know, what, what's the right thing to do? You know, and they had those that mix, that mix of green values and lefty values. And, hey, I earned all this money and I have a big ranch. Where do I go? You know, next. So our job was to sort of, you know, mediate between those things. And we uh, struggled mightily, you know, and rode all over. And, you know, you can see it wasn't easy to figure out where to go. And... Uh, and this is uh, Laura, who you know resorted to local, uh, I guess, lore, and then this little sticks, and that was her way of trying to locate the, the site. And uh, you know, we we gave it, a, you know, we gave it a good shot. And then uh, we, we weren't, you know, we're, nothing was like standing out. There's lots of good places, no one great place, and we we're still haunted by this question about what what would a farmer do? You know, what would a rancher do? Next, and then the, we were hit with an epiphany, symbolized by this, but it actually happened. You know, the rainbow bings, you know light from above, and we looked, and it was right, this, these little tacky buildings by the road, the original ranch, and then we said, well, the answer to the question, what a farmer would do is he, he already did it, you know, he built on the road, and that's where we should be. I mean, you know, you wouldn't build in the interior, you don't build that big road, you don't bring services in, none of that, you, you build and you use what you have, you know, you're back to it's all our feelings from the beginning. So we present this to the client, which was not an easy sell to begin with. I mean, when you own that ranch and you wanted the views, you want everything, say, well, wait, why don't you start with what you have? What are you going to do with it next? So these buildings were occupied by livestock and had been for 25 years. And we didn't fully comprehend what that meant until we started to dig underneath them. But in any event, we won't take you there. Uh, but anyway, we said, well, let's start with these and see what we can do. You know, and then you would first live there and then you know, come to know the land better. You know, you don't know where you want to be. We don't know where you want to put you. There's, we've been looking at it for a year. That must tell us something. So we started with these buildings. Next, and uh, you know, reformed them into a, a, a com, you know, sort of a compound, and uh, slid them around a little bit. And our philosophy all the way, of course, was to treat them not as a you know preservation, but as as a living thing that we were going to make our additions and add on to it but they're going to be legible. Next, um, you know, we looked at, you know, local, uh, local color. I mean, color goes a long way in that landscape. Next. And, uh, and then the structure. This was a, a granary that's, you know, obviously, you know, wrapped around to hold the forces and reweaving new structure with old. Next. And as we said, kind of recording our moves versus the moves that had been done over time. Next. And you know some of the analysis of the building next. And the the harder part actually was on the interior, where you know, it wasn't a simple formula of new old new old. You had to sort of work with, you know, uh, just a variety of kind of a palette to sort of try to weave the things, colors and the materials and the pieces together next. And 
So the, you know, some of this was salvaged wood from other barns, and some of it was new that we stained. And uh, the sort of actually the, uh, the personality of the owner came through with this. It was a half court, you know, basketball. And I think we kind of kept him from building in the center of his land. But when it came to you know playing basketball, he wanted it exactly a half court. So this uh, stair it lifts on a gantry out of the way, so you get that extra little bit there. You know, so next. So this is that compound. Next. And you know, this is the garage built out of two by next. And then the next rainbow hit. And uh, we were down at the other end of the property when this happened. And then you know, they said, OK, well, let's work on these other buildings. And uh, next. These rainbows happen fairly frequently there. We found out. But it's a good way to make a living. So you know, um, but in any event, you just have to time it. So th this was a, another granary in the hay barn. We worked into a, the headquarters for the office next. And then you can see that we have already remodeled that and added a bathroom on the next. And you get a feeling for, you know, so working with the existing and then adding, you know, to it. How do you manage that next? This is the, you know, ranch area, the so headquarters desk next. And then, you know, then this was the outhouse, and this was actually had been used as a cockfighting area, and they cleaned that up. I mean, it's just it was, it was a really crude place. Next, uh, but right at the end of the project, uh, they asked us to sort of redo the the John, you know, and they wanted to make that a, um, you know, a, a Clivus Multrum toilet. So to do that, we had to sort of take out what existed, which is obviously a pit underneath here, and then this toilet seat there. Which the more we kind of contemplated the toilet seat, the more we really felt we couldn't, you know, felt bad about taking it away. I mean, it's sort of a bit of the historical record because we asked people, well, why would you have three holes, you know? And, you know, normal Californian thing, they go, well, because you fill one, and you move the next one, then you move the next one, you move the next one, you go away. But that wouldn't explain why one was really small, and one was really big, and one was sort of medium big. I mean, they really had names on them. It felt like, you know. So uh, and then we talked to other people, and they said, "No, it's so cold here. When you went to the, you know, you know, at 45 below, you did not go alone. You went with friends, you know, and family." And um, but in any event, the whole discussion led us to this can't go away. Uh, it's just part of the historic record. So we started to work with it next, and uh, we made it into a light fixture, you know, which is sort of a bug's eye view because it's pretty much what a bug would have gotten, you know. I mean, it's just sort of this dark, and then this light blazing down. So uh, that was how we, we finished that one off. Next. And then uh, in the, along the process, we were hit by the rainbow. And we actually ended up buying this little building in town. And that's our field office. We're doing some other work in Montana now. Next. Or, that's it, actually. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. I really enjoy it. J Jim actually introduced me to your work when I started teaching with him at Boulder a number of years ago. I've, I've enjoyed watching your work and your career progress. Okay. My, my question really has to do with uh, mostly we seem to want to distinguish our work from everybody else's uh, to set ourselves apart. It always appeared to me that your work was part of a family of architects whose values and forms and treatment of space and color shared certain principles. And I have my own sense of who those other comrades are, but I wondered who, who you think you're with in the search for this kind of architecture. Who do you feel closest to as colleagues in the practice of, of your work, a anywhere around the world? Who, who are your closest? That's a really good patriots? question. I don't know if you have the answer. I don't know if I have the answer to that. Maybe you have the answer to that. I don't have an answer in terms of a specific firm, but I have an answer in terms of the kind of work. I mean, it, I think that people working not probably not in New York City, not in, I mean, it's it's the, 
it's the sense of people struggling to understand deeply where they are and to try to build appropriately for that. Maybe in New York City, maybe some amazing loft or something. But it's, I think it's those kinds of people that are really kind of obsessed with the place they're building in and they're drawing out of that um, the real content of what they're doing. I mean, it, and you know, I think we started with the, you know, the obviously we've looked a lot at, at people from the Bay Area. Um, I mean, I think they're, I mean, they're kind of, I don't know, you know, some of the people that I worked around in Switzerland, some of the people that, uh, some of these well-known Australians who are really doing some kind of amazingly site-specific work. Um, they're, yeah, yeah. Well, if, we, if we answer this question, will you answer it? Yeah, we want to hear yeah, your <laughs> list. We want, you give me, give me a little answer, then we get them to answer. Uh, well, probably Merkit. Probably, uh, this is embarrassing. I would say that this is totally embarrassing. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, there's some Pat Cow. I mean, they're doing wonderful work. Um, a lot of other really interesting Canadian architects that I think we're drawn to. I mean, also people that are really concerned with and obsessed with the making of buildings and the the joints and the laps and the materials that they're using. Um, that's that's a kind of beginning. I, I you know I could. Well, Peter Bolin, I admire Bolin? A little, some of his stuff a lot. Yeah. 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 Well, who are those guys in Texas? I'm blank. Blake Plato. Blake Plato. Yeah. Um, Ralph. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Is he still alive? <laughs> okay. No, I didn't know we get to, got a live one. That's no, no, one. definitely we have yeah, precise. Yeah, we can work with the dead. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, we can work with the dead. Definitely, Ralph Hurston. We yeah. actually looked a lot at his work. Yeah, yeah. that yeah, would definitely a, be one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, he would be one of them. Yeah. So that's tough question. That was good. Yeah. Though. Did you have anyone else in mind? Ralph Hurston's <laughs> good, really good company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, in the lumps and the things around that, we thought about Hertzberger around the yeah. theater. You know, kind of just pulling out a roof, giving a lump, just something to activate otherwise, you know, neutral or wasted space. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think a lot, I mean, they were quite influential when we were in school. I mean, I think they, they and Esherick, I mean, of the people in the Bay Area that were working at the time, and we looked at their stuff all the time, and still do. I, I go up to Sea Ranch for design review committee that I'm on once a month, and I'm constantly, I mean, they're the only good things there. I mean, constantly looking at those buildings. and, and But more Esherick than, than, I mean, I think the well, Sea Ranch, yeah. it's sort of problematic, at least for me, that, that work, because it, it, it knew a moment, and it was really wonderful, and that moment was the part that didn't really affect me strongly was two or three buildings long, you know, and uh, but, but it was really powerful, you know. I mean, just that response to place, yeah. and and then it became, you know, we know the history of that. Now that became something very different, very quickly, and historicist. And but that condominium is, is yeah. still a really powerful, good building. But that's that's why the Bay Area tradition almost kind of went and just come to that point, and then just had that. That you know, bracket, that first wave of it, and then uh, waiting for other waves. It, it's funny. I don't find it because he was he was also kind of a main mainstay when we were in school, and there's a. It's funny because when I first read the pattern language, I was really struck by how much I thought he had seen of the Berkeley Hills and sort of walking around the same neighborhood that we were working in, and how much he was drawing on, you know, whether it was Maybeck or Worcester, um, that he had really a lot of I think what he ended up observing and writing about came from that physical environment, um, and then it was elaborated on. Um, so there was, it's almost like the things he was drawing on were the things that we were drawing on, but it kind of comes out differently, I think. It's, 
Well, I think yes and no. I mean, in certain ways, I mean, my feeling about it was that, that he philosophically it was extremely different. I mean, there are points of overlap. I mean, that's what's wonderful about the pattern language is that it documents lots of good building experiences. You know, it's the philosophy behind it. You know, that got to be problematic in some ways. I think certainly the closer you were to the source of it, let's put it that way. And um, but I think the kind of partably what we find in the vernacular are some of those really awkward moments and those really odd, you know, conditions that you wouldn't think of. You know, it's not like a bench by a window. You know, it, it's like something penetrating something else. You know, or feet coming down through a mining shaft where it's that unself-conscious that we, you know, we call it the architecture of expedience where it actually gets to be rude or, or you know, unpleasant. And we'll take from a condition that was a, you know, an industrial place and see a way of solving a problem in a residence. You know? And so it, some of it is just even the mechanical, the informal strategy of how to actually apply building and even using bad manners. I mean, the, the sort of eloquence of you know, vernacular because it's the street architecture of, you know, I mean, the street language of architecture is another way we think about it. I mean, it's sort of direct, it's crude, sometimes, but it gets something done. And sometimes you go, I don't want to hear any more of that. And other ways, you say, that says it better than I could, you know. So it's a different relationship to it than, I mean, sometimes, I mean, Alexander, there are a series of goods and they're bona fide goods. It's not like, whoa, I see what you're saying, but shut up, you know, I mean, it's not that kind of thing. I think it's, it's more rule-based than observation-based. And I think there's a way yeah. we're constantly looking and, um, you know, as Richard said, it's not always pretty what we see, but it may be informative or useful. Or there's a, we used to have a collection of uh, images we called bad remodels. And it was a, you know. And I gave a really bad lecture <laughs> based on them. I, I thought it was brilliant, you know, I was just a you know, thing, but there were kind of just awkward moments in how, but it was a vernacular thing too. We just saw saw things that are popping or subtracting or you know penetrating and just saying, you know, once how, how, what does that tell you about the possibilities of making and shaping space, you know, and uh, especially starting from a, a known beginning, the first house that we did that really got any notoriety. I mean, it was a point a long time ago, but uh, we just picked a gable building and then applied you know green which were then known as solar strategies to it. Um, and so I worked on it with Jim. And, uh, but in any event, uh, you know, just because there was developing a, a language of what a solar building looked like, and it made no sense. I mean, I wrote an article about it at the time that, the, that worldwide you'd have one style to define something that was so patently local. You know, yes, certain movements are, you know, apply all around, certain principles apply around, but there was a local aspect to it, and it would, everything was like the same. So we were saying, well, what if you start with a house that looks like anyone else's house and just did those things you needed to do to make it work for this place and those set of variables? And uh, it's by adding and subtracting and penetrating in different ways and somewhat exaggerating that. But uh, it's a different attitude, I think, a little bit. Well, we just did a really large building. You know, usually we do those in conjunction with somebody. We, we did a, believe it or not, a, a 300,000 square foot library with SOM. And we did the planning for um, the University of California Merced campus. We didn't show it. We had to cut a lot of stuff out. But we were on the planning team with them and then wrote the uh, guidelines for the new campus. And uh, we did the library. And it, it was not a... Uh, easy uh, collaboration in many, many ways. I mean, especially when it got down to really doing the building or doing a building. And uh, I mean, I want, we wanted to bring it one way because what's interesting is because if you see our ideas sort of blown through kind of a generic modernism, you know, and you see, you know, some of it gets caught like in the, in the grid, you know, you can see that in conceptually, the way we attack the building is very much us. And then the more elaborated it got, the more sort of generically good taste it became. I mean, you had very elegant, you know, printed glass, solar screens, and all kinds of things. But the part that was genuinely ours, I think, was it was a knuckle in the center of the building 
where we sort of saw what a library was becoming was much more disappearing what, what I might love in a library and you might love a library, you know, sitting down with uh, a new piece of material, a book, maybe, maybe a computer, and spending quiet time learning something, but that's kind of going away, that's passe. <laughs> but we kind of condensed that into one, one building that this more generic space came into that can be reprogrammed and reused then we have this core that was uh, sort of what we would think of what we thought of as the library, the periodical reading. And on the bottom floor of it, we had very much like that house. We, we would have showed it with the house with the door that opened up and the, you know, those, because we did that at a massive scale. So on the, this thing, probably 60 feet square, it went up five stories. But on the bottom, all these doors opened up and it was an outdoor loggia. And then the buildings were set like those other ones to pick up on breezes off this lake. So you're in the middle of this building, you know, but it's just all the furniture is outside and you get a breeze. And so that was the idea sort of blown up. But I don't know if most people recognize that. That was the campus reading room. I mean, that was the main campus reading room. Yeah. 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 No, we admire those commissions, I really. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, good. Oh, sorry.